Hello and welcome to Under the Dome from Town Meeting TV. My name is Bobby Lucier. Under the Dome is a program on Town Meeting TV covering Vermont, the uh, Vermont legislature. And this year's session wrapped up back in June. So we've had a couple months now. And uh, we have a chance now to speak with the leaders of the Vermont legislature to take a look at what was accomplished in the first half of the biennium and what's to come in 2024. So. Um, for today's program, we're joined by one half of the legislative leadership, uh, President Pro Tempore of the Vermont Senate, Phil Bruth. Thanks Good to so be much. here, Bobby. Yeah, thank you. We'll also have a program with uh, Speaker Jill Kowinski in the studio next week, but uh, today we'll start off on the Senate side of things. So um, thank you so much, Senator. This was your first term as President Pro Tempore of the Senate. Um, How'd it go? What was, the, <laughs> <laughs> what was the transition like? So you served on the floor, and now you're in the leadership position, um, yeah. you know, what did you learn about the position? What kind of, what's the job description like? Yeah, sure. Um, I think you'd have to ask other people in the state house how I did, um, but I'll, I'll just say my experience was fantastic. Um, I've always loved the Senate as an institution. The pro tem has a really particular responsibility in terms of bringing things to the floor, making sure the votes are there for those things, and then moving them through not only the Senate, but the House, and then past the governor uh, in the best case scenario. So at all points, committee, floor, House, governor, um, a bill is under fire in one way or another, and it's the pro tem's job to be um, running defense and offense simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Right, and so yeah, there are hundreds of bills you know, that were introduced this year and only a portion of them actually advance. And, and mm -hmm. is your, you, so your office is kind of uh, stewarding in a way those, those bills to, de to decide which ones actually get heard on the floor, is that correct? Yeah, um, I, I wouldn't underplay at all the role of the committee chair people. Right. So um, a committee chair decides what's gonna get a hearing in their committee. I will sometimes bring a chair in and say, it's crucial that we have hearings on this and this bill should move forward. But basically committee chairs make those decisions with the exception of maybe four or five bills that the caucus, in this case, Democrats and progressives, all together decide are uh, must pass bills. And then once we have those kind of top priorities, then they become my top priorities and I make sure that they move through the process and don't get bogged down by silly things like missing a deadline or um, lacking a vote here or there. Okay, right. And so do you have a sense of how many bills were introduced versus how many actually were read and how many were kind of left up on the board this year? Yeah, so I would say hundreds of bills were introduced. Um, with the House and the Senate together, I wanna say, may, I would guess maybe 600 bills. About 60 went to the governor, um, ultimately, and Phil Scott made his decision to veto a number of those, a, a relatively high number, I think eight or nine vetoes. We overrode six of those vetoes, which was historic, had never been done before that I know of. Um, so I, I think that's a testament to the fact that uh, voters have continued to press for certain things and those things happen to be some of them things Phil Scott didn't want to sign, like the child care bill. Right. And so we passed the child care bill over his uh, veto, and that's now law. And we'll get to a couple more of those um, specific bills that you worked on this year, but yeah. I want to also back up. So you, does your office also choose or somehow decide who is chairing what committee? Is that also? Not, not just my office. Okay. So. Uh, Jill Krowinski has, mm -hmm. in her own person, complete power to do that, uh, which I envy. Uh, but in the Senate, it's called the Committee on Committees, believe it or not. And um, the Committee on Committees is composed of the pro tem, myself, David Zuckerman, who's the lieutenant governor, and Dick Mazza from uh, Colchester. And he's what's known as the third member of the Committee on Committees. Uh, those are all elected positions. But once the three of us come together, we sit down with a, a little map of the open committee chairs and we uh, hash it out and come up with a slate that we think is most effective. Right. And how did that go this year? I thought it went brilliantly. Um, you know, I, I, 
I hate to give names because then I'll leave somebody out, but I will say that we had some new chairs, and among those new chairs were Keisha Rahm, uh, Ruth Hardy. They did fantastic work. Um, and then chairs who have been around a long time, Jane Kitchell, Dick Sears, um, they always do yeoman work. Um, and so I, I thought our chairs, um, the other money chair that I'll mention is Ann Cummings. Um, it, it was a very smoothly functioning operation, and those people are, you know, m many of them, operating with decades of knowledge about how to advance their bills. So that's all to the good. Right. And you mentioned Speaker Kwinski. Um, what does it look like for your office to be collaborating with the Speaker's office and making sure that the House and the Senate are on the same page as best you can be to um, right. collaborate and move, move bills forward? Yeah, so Jill and I have a very solid, very positive relationship. Um, and we agree on many things and we work very smoothly on almost everything. But I would say that, um, you know, the Senate and the House are different chambers. They are meant to be uh, contesting one another. That's part of the process. Mm -hmm. So there are certain moments where we can't agree, and then there are extra procedures that we can use to reach agreement. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you never do. So um, I'll give you an example, and, and it's an example where nobody's right and nobody's wrong. So for years, the House wanted primary seatbelt enforcement. In other words, they wanted a policeman who sees you're not wearing your seatbelt to be able to stop you for that. Currently, you can't do that in Vermont. You have to be stopped for something else, and then if they see you're not wearing your seatbelt, they can add that. Um, makes sense, and I think they're right that it would probably, over a couple of years, reduce the number of accidental deaths. On the other hand, in the Senate, the argument has always been that that sort of um, primary seatbelt enforcement is used around the country in a uh, systemically racist way to single out drivers of color and use the seatbelt as an excuse to pull them over and harass them. And so uh, Senator Tim Ash was always eloquent on this point that he didn't want to have primary seatbelt enforcement for that reason because he felt it might, uh, it might wind up being used to single out drivers of color. Mm. So each side had a strong argument, but at the end of the day, couldn't agree, and so we don't have a law in that area. Right. It's interesting to see, you know, that the, both bodies are representing ultimately the same larger constituency, but can end up voting di differently on a, on a couple of, of, of issues like that. Um, and it just makes me, you know, what what are the, you know, are there different priorities? Were there different priorities this year in the House and the Senate? I know there were a couple yep. kind of bigger disagreements, but you know, what did that look like? How do you characterize the differences there in priorities? Yeah, so um, recreational cannabis was another area that the House and the Senate disagreed on traditionally. It took about five or six years for us to really reach agreement uh, to get to the where, where we are today. Um, we had a disagreement over how much to do how quickly in terms of paid family leave and childcare. Both very expensive, very broad-based programs that would require expansions of government uh, as well as taxation. And so at the end of the day, the Senate's position was we can't do both. Um, we'd like to work on childcare. Uh, as it turned out, that's where the, the House and the Senate went. And as I mentioned earlier, we managed to move that historic bill through the process. Um, that doesn't mean we're not interested in paid family leave, but typically um, in the Senate, that's been a lower priority than in the House. Um, we'll see what happens this coming session. Yeah. So is that a paid family medical leave is, is, is something that's on the top of the list for the, the coming session? I, or? I, I think in the House it's at the top of the list. We don't have a list in the Senate yet. Okay. We, uh, we won't develop that priority list until November, December, once we're back together, all the senators, 30 of us, um, we can begin to talk about what we think the priority should be. And then as we come into the session in January, that'll translate into which bills go to which committees and which come to the floor. Right. So you mentioned the child care bill. I know there are a couple other pretty big bills that passed mm -hmm. this year. Um, 
Can you talk about a couple of those bills that you're bills yeah. that you're most proud of that that uh, were were passed this year, either with the governor's uh, um, governor's signature or without, and how they'll impact? Oops, how they'll yeah. impact Vermonters. Um, let me just mention gun safety yeah. um, because that's a, a big issue for me, and this was an amazing year for a couple of reasons. Amazing because of what we were able to pass. So we passed a 72-hour waiting period to purchase a firearm in Vermont, which we've tried many times in the past. We, four or five years ago, we passed a 24-hour waiting period that the governor vetoed. We couldn't override. This was the first year that we had the, the solid 20 votes to override a gubernatorial veto. For that reason, I believe, the governor decided to let our omnibus bill become law without his signature. But that included the 72-hour waiting period, safe storage of guns, and it expanded our red flag laws, our uh, emergency risk protection order laws, so that family members who feel threatened by a family member with a gun can initiate the process, and then if a judge determines that that person is an actual threat, those guns can be removed from the site. Now, those things together, any one of them, five years ago would have killed a bill. Um, and so for that reason, they, they kept being held out, kept being held out. We decided to move them all together in one session, and, um, and that was successful. Now, remaining in front of us is court review. The Supreme Court has made gun laws um, tougher to get through and tougher to have withstand constitutional scrutiny. The federal Supreme Court or the Vermont Supreme Yeah, the Court? Supreme Court of the United States. So um, we'll see where they go. They've accepted a case, so they've indicated they are going to rule again on guns this coming session. And so I think it's smart to wait and see what that decision looks like before we try to advance something at the scale we did last year. Right. Um, just to talk about a couple of those other bills, that I know the clean heat standard was one yeah. that got a lot of attention. It's also a complicated bill. I remember I had um, we had uh, Jared Duvall and Matt Coda in to talk a little bit about that bill and unpack it. Must it. have been a fun conversation. It was a fun yeah. conversation, and um, but it, as you can imagine, it got really into the weeds, and trying to yeah. pull us out of the weeds was really difficult. I'm mm -hmm. so curious how you you know how do you try to describe the impact of that bill on you know the typical rural, rural Vermonter, the typical Burlingtonian, how do you yeah. describe what that bill actually does? Well, um, there was a lot of misinformation about that bill. And um, without putting too fine a point on it, I'll say much of it was deliberate misinformation. Um, the fossil fuel sector feels that it's in a fight for its life because the rest of this society has correctly decided that we have to get off of fossil fuels because we are flooding, we are burning, uh, we are um, you know, at the mercy of our environment because we've made bad decisions in the past. So S5 was this year's comprehensive climate change legislation. I think of it as a way to um, create slowly but surely a new business model for fossil fuel dealers. So what we ask them to do among other things are to help people move in the direction of more sustainable energy sources, help them get heat pumps, help them get other things that are better for the planet. Um, and, you know, Vermont Gas and some other um, dealers made the decision to help out with that bill because they realized that's where the future lies. So um, Neil Underville was, uh, I think, uh, a very smart voice on that issue. And he made exactly that point, that the business model has changed, the industry needs to follow that change, and that's what S5 is directed to do. Um, so looking ahead to next year, the mm -hmm. second half of the biennium, what's different about the second year in a biennium than the first? And you mentioned some of those things that you think will come up. You know, What do you expect to be deliberated on in, in 2024? Well, a couple basic things are different about the second year. So in the first year, when you, when you adjourn, nothing dies. Anything that didn't make it through the process is still alive on the wall. In the second year, when you adjourn Sina DA, final, um, that means every bill that's on the wall is now dead. So people get a lot more um, 
worked up about whether their bills are going to live or die. Constituents, advocacy groups, special interests all get a lot more worked up. That coincides with the start of the election year. And so put all those things together, there's, I would say, usually more drama in the second year and less achievement mm -hmm. often because um, the, the lights are so bright on everything that's going on, expectations are so high, partisan uh, considerations become more a thing because the election is moving to the fore. Um, and for that reason, um, I think people are less inclined to swing for the fences in the second year. It gets a little more, um, you know, a little more cautious. People don't want to make big mistakes if they're going to make a mistake. Right. And I just want to backtrack to something, you know, I, I, the House um, having such a strong support for a family and medical mm -hmm. leave um, or family leave bill, and then the Senate, um, if I remember correctly, not even having the votes for a simple majority, whereas the House had a supermajority. Is that correct? Or well, I, I would say that um, it, was a little, uh, it was a little hard to tell. And in part, it was because you had child care on the table, which was going to be funded at the cost of about $125 million a year. And if we were going to pony up that much money for child care, there were some people who, had child care not been on the table, might have been in favor of paid family leave. But given that the two of them, the price tags were so high, mm -hmm. I think it was questionable whether we could have passed the bill, but probably we could have. But there was no way we could have overridden a gubernatorial veto, and there would have absolutely been one, because the governor has rolled out a voluntary plan that he's very protective of. So um, he made it clear in no uncertain terms that he would veto uh, paid family and medical leave as conceived by the House. Right. Is there more of, you know, I mean, you mentioned kind of the considerations behind why the Senate was a little more reluctant to mm -hmm. pass both big bills. Mm -hmm. The House was excited to pass both big bills. Yep. Do you, you know, how do you character, you know, is, is the Senate a more frugal body or is that, why, why <laughs> value one over the other in the Senate? Whereas yeah. the House, the, representing again the same groups of people are, are coming forward and with support for both. Yeah, I, I wish it was as easy as saying that one is more fiscally conservative than the other, but it just doesn't work that way. It's, it's absolutely issue by issue. Mm -hmm. So if we go back to recreational cannabis, um, that was something that the Senate got behind and strongly behind and sent over, I want to say five or six times to the House and only to have it die. Mm -hmm. From that, you might say, well, the House is more socially conservative. They're, you know, leery about increasing drug use, uh, even if it's a recreational drug. Um, but I don't think that's true because there are other moments, for instance, in harm reduction where the House might be uh, further to the left, let's say, or a little more left-leaning in its thoughts about, uh, you know, harm reduction when it comes to opiates than the Senate. So we switch identities all the time given whatever the particular issue is. Um, and as I say, the Senate has a history of support for paid family and medical leave, but less so than the House, I think. <clears throat> you mentioned sort of drama at the end of the session or that, that you yeah. anticipate in 2024. Uh, one issue that got a lot of attention uh, towards the end of this session was the motel housing program. So this was a program that was funded by COVID, federal COVID funding during the pandemic to house as many as over 3,000 people um, during, the, during the pandemic. And that funding was set to expire this year, which meant that the program was set to end. And uh, at the beginning of the session, it seemed like the uh, legislative leadership and the governor were not prioritizing extending this program. And then mm -hmm. at the end of the session, there's this big push um, from advocates uh, to keep some form of the program alive. And when all was said and done, some form of the program uh, was, was kept alive. About 2,100 people were allowed to stay in mm -hmm. motels until April of next year. And there's another cliff on the program. And the state is now footing the bill now that the federal funding has expired. So mm -hmm. can you just kind of walk us? I think there's a really interesting example of, of, of uh, 
the legislature, you know, how, how, what informs the legislature's position maybe moving on something. Yeah. Um, can you walk us through just what changed in that time that brought that issue up in priority towards the end and how a deal was actually reached? Sure. So I sit on the Appropriations Committee, um, among others, and um, in that committee we had testimony from AHS, the Human Services Agency, um, again and again that they were um, in favor of ending the program and that they were prepared to care for the people as they transitioned out of the program. So to the extent that we take testimony in appropriations, it's not like a, you know, a standard committee where you might have two weeks or a month of testimony on something. In appropriations, you have to move relatively quickly because everybody's bills are coming through your committee. So we um, did our due diligence in terms of talking a number of times with the agency about what they felt they had going on the ground that would support these folks. With that said, originally the administration wanted to close the program in March. Uh, the House went along with that. The Senate said, let's wait till June 1st when the warm weather comes. So that carried the day. We wrote the budget that way. And then when the budget had been passed, we went out of session. We began to get briefings from AHS and the first briefing, uh, which was about an hour, was eye-opening for me and others. It, it began to seem to us that they did not have plans in place. They had, in effect, plans to get plans. So they had, uh, just a couple of days prior, they had issued a call for, propo for proposals, um, an RFP, asking municipalities and others to come forward with ideas, concepts, about how to care for these folks and other homeless folks. So um, we realized very quickly that they were not uh, where they had thought they were. And, and that I, hearing was when? That was, um, I guess, the beginning of June. Okay. Um, so we adjourned middle of May and a couple weeks later. So with that said, no, um, I, I don't attribute any bad intent or motive to AHS, it's a complicated job. I think they thought they had the resources in place. Clearly they didn't. So uh, my office began to work with Emily Kornheiser from the House. Um, who Emily is uh, as smart as they come um, and I enjoyed very much working with her on that. And together we put together what's now Act 81, which extended the motel program out to April and calls for monthly um, joint fiscal committee hearings where we provide oversight of the administration's attempts to move this cohort out of the motel program into equivalent housing, something that's um, not a congregate homeless shelter, but an apartment or some other setting that um, is suitable for their condition. Right. So and and so there will be there's a process in place to uh, move to to at the end of April um, make sure that these folks have housing. Is that well? April's the the drop dead date. Right. So um, funding is there until until mm -hmm. we get back in session, and then we'll add a little more. But we will. Um, You'll add a little more. What do you mean? So in other words, we um, on the fly because we were out of session. We scrambled to find the money that we would need to get the motel program until we're back in session in January. Then we do what's called budget adjustment. And in budget adjustment, once we're up and running again, we will appropriate more money to the motel program um, to make it whole. Then um, I, I think the important thing is the agency is now engaged on a person-to-person -person basis with this cohort of you know, I, th I think it's a little less than 2,000 now, trying to place these folks. Um, do they need, uh, you know, something like assisted living? Do they need um, an apartment? There's a new apartment complex going up, uh, an opening, uh, Champlain Housing Trust is opening in South Burlington, and there'll be apartments there for some of these folks because they have priority over uh, others as we're trying to move them out of this program. So um, come April, it may be that there are no uh, 
motel occupants left, in which case we would close out the program. If that's not the case, let's say there are still 400 people in the motels, then we will extend until we um, place all of those people individually. Do you see the motel, you know, there was an episode of the podcast Brave Little State that came mm -hmm. out a couple of days ago from Vermont Public that a question asker said, well, why, don't, why doesn't the state just buy the motels to provide a permanent solution for, well, a, a, a permanent approach to a temporary solution for housing for yeah. these folks? Is that something that's on your radar, the Senate's radar at all? We, the answer is we have. Um, we've bought 13 so far. Um, the intent is to buy more. So we're using what's called the Oregon model, where they did this. They purchased motels. Oregon, a much, much bigger state and more populous state, has only done, I think, 19 motels. We've done 13, uh, which per capita is more. But there's a weird dynamic in place, which is the state is now paying 24-7 to fill those motels. So if you're the motel owner, you're making really good money at this point. So the price you might ask uh, for your motel has gone up. So if the motel is valued at a million and the owner wants three million or four million, the state's not gonna pony up that money. So one of the things in Act 81 requires the state to renegotiate the amount we're paying per room. And that's designed to save the state money, but also to bring it down to a more realistic level, how much money these owners are making from the program and hopefully that changes their calculus so they're willing to sell more often in more places in the state. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned this a little bit, but you're, it sounds like you sort of painted a vision for um, you know, a housing solution for these folks that leans on existing infrastructure, there, that there might be rooms in the state that um, you know, these folks can reach with help from AHS and others um, it's well, if I, yeah, if, go ahead. If I gave that impression, that's only half. Okay. The other half is that, um, over the last three years, um, since the pandemic, we've infused a half a billion dollars, 500 million plus in building permanent affordable housing. So you see it in the pit in Burlington, uh, where the mall used to be. There's affordable housing going up there. I mentioned the units coming online in South Burlington. Um, Champlain Housing Trust and others are engaged every single day in taking the money we put forward, um, trying to remember what the final number was in this budget, but on the order of 100, 150 million into housing, uh, and all with the idea of bringing it online within the next few years, so two, three years. So. Can we build our way out of the problem? No. Can we just use existing housing and get our way out of the problem? No. But the thought is if we're operating on all those fronts at once, um, it may take three or four years, but our hope is to get us to the point where um, people are not on the street because they can't find a house. Um, if they are on the street, it would be other issues. I wanna move to a related question here, which is, about the overdose crisis yeah. that the state is facing. So, um, <clears throat> at least in Burlington, I live in Burlington, you live in Burlington, mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot of discourse about public safety as well as drug use um, this summer, I mean, over the past few years. And, you know, I live on Elmwood Avenue mm -hmm. um, and I've seen a huge increase in drug use on the streets, property theft, um, there's been an unprecedented amount of overdose deaths recorded, uh, you know, as, um, thus far this year. Uh, we put out an ask on our social media channels before this program to say, hey, we're talking with Senator Bruth, what, what do you want us to ask about? And the majority of those questions came in were about mm -hmm. the overdose crisis. What is the state doing to address the overdose crisis? So um, how are you thinking about um, the state's mm -hmm. approach to the overdose crisis as well as um, the state's safety. approach to public safety? Yeah. yeah. So first of all, I've lived in Burlington 30 years and I would say we've never been free of the problem of homelessness. It is um, a problem that goes up and down. Right now, nationally, there's a homeless crisis. San Francisco, among other places, Portland, Oregon, um, places where the homeless crisis has overwhelmed municipal governments. 
Um, fortunately, we're not there, um, but we do need immediately more congregate shelters. So Burlington put forward a proposal that I supported to use the Cherry Street um, complex, which the state is considering selling. It's state owned. Um, but Burlington came forward and said, let us use that building. We will refashion it for um, overnight homeless folks and move them off the street. The state, for reasons I still don't understand, rejected that proposal. Um, but I am still in talks with AHS about trying to get them to support it. Because rather than sell the Cherry Street Complex to a company like, you know, dealer.com or some other great company that would turn it into a nice office building, it is state owned. It is something that with some refurbishing could be used to help this crisis. So those efforts are ongoing. Public safety, you know, I've, I've had a couple of people uh, this week reach out to me um, from the Old North End, frightened about conditions where their kids play, frightened about walking on the street, et cetera. That's something that is at a point that's probably among the worst since I've been here. There was a time in the 90s that I think was equivalent in terms of the concerns about public safety. But when you look at um, the opioid crisis and what we're doing, and especially fentanyl and its role in uh, deaths by overdose, I, I think the steps that we took last year are important, obviously not enough. But among other things, we were trying in several different ways to increase testing of the drugs that people are ingesting. So um, xylazine strips uh, that would allow people to test for themselves what their drugs might or might not have in them. But we passed something a little more controversial, which was uh, a law that would allow people to bring their, um, their small bag of uh, narcotics into a site, have it tested, given back to them, and they're free to leave. Um, now, obviously, there were critics of that policy in the, in the House and the Senate who said, um, these drugs are illegal. If they bring them to the authorities, how can the authorities not arrest them? But the analogy that I made was, um, we have folks in Vermont who uh, are undocumented, who work on farms, and they help us save the dairy industry by providing that labor. Sometimes they're called to go to court uh, to testify on behalf of a friend or something like that. And what ICE and immigration were doing is they would wait for the person to finish testifying and then they would arrest them as they came out of court and deport them. And it made those folks afraid to go to court for any reason and that undermined our justice system. So we passed a law saying, if you're gonna testify, you can't be stopped going to the courthouse and you can't be stopped leaving the courthouse. This is a very similar thing. You can't be arrested with those drugs going to get them tested or leaving the testing lab, but after you've left and you're you know, elsewhere in the city, they remain uh, you know, controlled substances and you can be arrested. And that was a that was proposed, but not passed. That was passed. That was passed. Yeah. Okay. But and and you know in New York City, I know there's a safe injection site. Is that I I know there was discussion yep. about that concept in the Senate. Where did that Where did that end up? I think it's still that is still a question of competing legalities. Um, municipalities like Burlington, I believe Burlington has now satisfied itself that it won't be liable um, if it opens such a site. But there are concerns that if the state is running those sites and someone leaves and commits uh, a crime or um, you know, has a crash because they've ingested at a state-sponsored site, there are public safety concerns attached to it. I, I would say that that has not reached consensus in the House or the Senate. And um, so we haven't uh, really voted on it as such. But I expect in the next year or two, that will come to the Senate floor. Right. We've talked about a couple smaller approaches. I just want to back up and trying to think big picture. I know it's a really hard question to answer, but you know, do you see kind of a, a, a pathway? Like what's the overarching vision for getting out of the overdose crisis? It's the combination of some of these things or mm -hmm. what? 
what do you foresee as you know being necessary investments and regulatory changes needed to actually um, to actually um, get us out of this over over crisis and support the you know, people who are drug users? I don't think anybody has the answer to that. Yeah. I, I don't think any any government any advocacy organization the the opioid epidemic is um, well I mean opiates have been around for thousands of years and they have plagued civilizations going back thousands of years. So um, the addictive power of those drugs is so intense and fentanyl is not the be all and end all. There are more powerful opiates coming online uh, even stronger than fentanyl. So, um, you know, I, I think clearly economic desperation drives it. We are a society where income inequality is at historic levels. People have a difficult time uh, buying a house, getting a college education, etc. So, you know, if I pull back to the, the largest extreme, it seems to me that the opiate epidemic capitalizes on the ways in which American society is uh, systematically unequal. And, you know, the fact that we have eight or ten uh, multi-billionaires who control the vast majority of wealth in the country, to me that seems like um, part of the root cause rather than uh, a parallel cause. Do you see the Vermont legislature having any leverage points to deal with the wealth inequality that you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, we, um, our approach, uh, Democrats and progressives alike, has been that if, if we're going to make society more affordable, and this is where we differ with the governor. The governor talks affordability constantly, but his vision of affordability is really preventing legislation that he thinks will uh, make things worse, right? And that's the root of the conservative idea. Um, but any active attempt to make things affordable by, in terms of childcare, childcare as we passed it does two major things. It subsidizes parents so that they're only paying uh, a, a much smaller percentage of their income, but it also increases the wages for the people who supply that kind of care. And by hitting both of those points, we're looking to make that, instead of a, a system that depresses the people that are taking part in it, we're looking to make that uh, a kind of hopeful system where people can get a slot for their kid. They can afford it, and the people who work there and love it can, can make a living. But that means that we have to have a dedicated funding source to pay for that, and that's where the governor parts ways with us because he would like to leave the system as it is, um, and his move actively toward affordability is to say the state can't raise DMV fees, which, you know, those fees pay for our roads, they pay for the services, um, and that's not where the affordability crisis is coming from. Right. I want to shift now to uh, talk a little bit about the flooding from this summer. So it looks like over 4,000 homes have been damaged by flooding this year. Many small businesses are really struggling to open up their doors again and will probably have to close. Um, we have to expect that flooding like this will happen again as the climate warms. How do you see the legislature uh, approaching uh, climate resilience, building climate resilience across the state so that we're more prepared for climate disasters like this one in the future? Yeah. Um, so my first biennium, we had uh, Tropical Storm Irene, and it was regarded as a once-in-a-hundred-year event, um, and it was horrible. I mean, I was mucking out people's cellars with them. There were, there were people who lost everything. The state did a lot to help out, and we got smarter in some ways. So this uh, flooding, um, you know, the, the floods of June, uh, or I'm sorry, July, it, it happened that I wound up in Barrie, in the basement of the old Barrie Labor House. And I was part of a team that was taking out all the dry well in the basement, which had all been uh, drenched and was turning to mold. And so I was down there with a group of 30 or so people, and we were removing everything. And my job was in the bathroom, 
and um, and it was a it was a a learning experience for me about the the worst place to find yourself after a flood. But I also saw something hopeful in that basement, which was after Irene, they moved the electrical and the heating system out of the basement to the first floor in case there was another flood. And so we were working with drywall, and that was bad, but we weren't working with the electrical. We weren't working with heat. Um, so in addition to Vermont Strong, we had gotten Vermont Smart and started this kind of resiliency uh, thinking 10 years ago. And in part, it helped us this time. Another example I'll give you. Uh, so once the flooding happened and it became clear that people who hadn't moved their furnaces out of the basement, people who hadn't moved um, whatever they were using to heat water um, in their homes out of the basement, a lot of that stuff was wrecked and they were going to have to start from scratch. So what we worried about was that FEMA money and grant money from the state would be used to buy fossil fuel uh, based systems for these new homes. And nobody was uh, down with that. So we worked very quickly with the governor's office, the House uh, Efficiency Vermont to create a program to direct the money um, into grants so that people who lost their furnace, lost their hot water heater, lost their heat pumps, can buy those um, more sustainable options with this grant money. And to me, that's an example of how the normal function of government, which is to move money to people in need, um, gets inflected by climate change. Mm -hmm. Right. There's so much devastation from this flooding, as you saw firsthand. Um, do you see the resources, do you, do you think the resources that are needed for the recovery are available and, and, and ready to, and, and I know they're being deployed in some, in some cases, but do you see there being a need for additional resources for recovery, or do you think that the resources are available and, and, and sufficient right now? I think if you talk to people on the ground, they'll say they haven't gotten the money they need. And, and that's a, that's a flat-out uh, way to put it. But for instance, the unemployment aid that was going to go out to people who were temporarily unemployed because of the flood, none of that has gone out even as we speak. Um, the business grants have started going out, um, and that's a good thing. But I think in general, people would say they're going to need more in the way of resources, and especially that unemployment aid. The administration is now saying this coming week, they'll get those checks in the mail. But when you think about it, that's July to now. That's a long time for people who are not, uh, you know, enjoying their normal wage. Right. I know we have just a couple minutes left. I want to transition over really quickly to the issue of language access, which sure. is one that um, we pay attention closely to here at CCTV, which houses the Vermont Language Justice Project, which mm -hmm. creates um, produces informational videos. Which I've in, seen, and those are great. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Those are. Uh, providing life-saving information for, for um, folks in the community that have language access needs. Um, the Office of Racial Equity released a report earlier this year with some mm -hmm. recommendations about um, investing in language access, um, but there's still, there's still a huge need and we're kind of just sort of catching up in terms of translating documents on websites, but mm -hmm. uh, what we found, at least in the Language Justice Project, is you know there's a lot of the folks who can't um, who have language access needs also cannot read or write in their own language mm -hmm. um, that they do speak, which is why videos are uh, an effective way to reach them. Um, so how is the legislature thinking about language access right now and, and, and um, you know, has there been anything passed this year or coming up next year that you see expanding language access? Yeah. Um, so before we leave the flooding, I'll just say that uh, uh, Senator Keisha Rahm, the minute the flooding happened, she was on this issue uh, in, in a very effective way in terms of making sure that people who had been affected by the flooding um, but who weren't English speakers were going to be able to get life-saving information, uh, or even not life-saving, but quality of life-saving information, um, where to get help, where to get grants, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, and so she worked with the administration to make sure that they were getting that spectrum of information out. The one uh, other area I'll mention, because it comes to mind, um, we had a complaint a couple of years back that um, non-English speakers who were looking to 
become policemen were having trouble because they were having trouble studying for the exam and then taking the exam to become a policeman. Um, and so that was one area where we worked on making sure that there was funding to go into that particular area. But it might be that we need some sort of standing government office to direct funding to these kind of needs. Right. Thank you so much, Senator, for your time today. I think we're all out of time, but absolutely really appreciate you coming in and chatting about the session yeah. and what's coming up next year. And um, yeah, thank you for being here. Good to talk to you, Bobby. Excellent. And thank you so much for tuning in to Under the Dome from Town Meeting TV. We'll see you next time.